As the West Russian Revolutionary Front collapsed in the end of the West Russian War, our republic was born. It served as an end to the cycles of violence and chaos, greeting exiles and refugees welcome to our small state. However, all is not well, our republic is brewing with political conflict from both the left and the right. The centrist government has a massive task ahead of them to stop these radical opponents. However, their own coalition is starting to form cracks. The head of the coalition, Voznesensky, the most left-wing of them all, has maintained relations with Andrei Zadanov, a socialist, to the frightenment of his coalition members. But to retain power, Voznesensky decided to accept their problems with Andrei and promised to break ties with him once the time was right. With regained strength in the coalition, they managed to pass the 1962 budget, opening the road to several important acts, such as the Infrastructure Repair Bill, surprisingly passing through with the help of the right, which managed to drive through their penal labor plan and the Comprehensive Zoning Reform Bill, also passing with the help and influence of the right. This has led to some worry among the coalition, but it was all overshadowed by a bigger event. A new charismatic communist candidate has risen up as a new enemy of the state, and with several paramilitary groups under the control of Suslov, the government decided to put their efforts on dealing with the communists. Investigating and cracking down on the new candidate and observing their paramilitaries to try and uncover their plans. While effective at dealing with the left, it would soon prove to be a complete disaster for the center government. The weakening of the communists didn't strengthen the centrists. It strengthened the right, as the government naively continued with cracking down socialist propaganda leading to a strike in one third of our army. Not to risk a foreign intervention, the government with pressure from the right decided to bring in the reserves, only continuing to strengthen the right. And this influence and strength was seen in the National Assembly as well. Stopping a mandated minority representation bill and a bill to force the breakup of all paramilitary groups, and successfully passing a bill of an extended conscription. Back on the streets where an increased activity of right paramilitaries cracking down on anything left and a new leader of the fascist party has finally opened the eyes of the government. But it is too late now. A split in the Social Democrat Party has rendered them powerless. New laws and bills have been impossible to pass now that no one holds a majority. But no one cares, every party is preparing for the upcoming elections. Volunteers have already been called in to secure a stable one. The people going to vote will be protected. This includes taking notes on when the German bombers aren't bombing and observing the radical groups to stop them from harassing any voters. After days of preparation, our country is finally ready to vote. We are now venturing into the unknown. As the booths opened, violence sprung up in several polling locations, scaring away voters. But the day was soon over and the votes were counted. Later the same week, it was announced that the new president of our republic would be Shafarevich, the second most influential right-wing candidate. But altogether, the right have managed to secure a majority. The trajectory of Komi's future is now drastically changing. Some say for the better, others for the worse, but the new government has already started reforming our country. Their first goal is to create a compassionate state, one where the citizens' need is taken care of, mostly to further isolate the Bolsheviks. The biggest reform in their reform packet is that of social programs. They plan to assist hard-working laborers who are approaching retirement. But everything isn't so wholesome. They've began cracking down on trade unions, all to end the Bolshevik legacy. But they went further than this. As they entered power, they promised to tear down the corrupt democracy and replace it with a pure and stable nation. The first step in this was of course to target Suslov and his communists to end their threat to the leadership. Using emergency power, they called out the communist party as terrorists and completely shut it down, finding and killing Suslov after a week. 
but words have spread to the government that several military commanders are preparing a coup in retaliation. To combat this threat, our defense minister appointed several sympathetic generals that immediately started dealing with the generals loyal to the Communist Party. They were all sent to court and soon punished to death. All this conspiracy against the government and an incident where a few communist party members captured an artillery piece shelling our capital has led to the National Democracy Act to pass through parliament. Of course, this is nothing more than a tool for the president and his cabinet to secure total power, promising to save democracy while undoubtedly killing it. Now having assumed total power, the government began looking outside of our borders. More money will be spent on our military and investment into our industry will prepare us for the campaign to reunify Russia. Let it begin. We will now be known as the Provisional Government of Russia and our first and foremost goal is to unite West Russia and then all of Russia. However, with complete power, the different parties in the government are beginning to fight each other. There is of course Igor Shafarevich, our president and the most moderate wing of the alliance. Then there is Lev Gumilyov, the pioneer of the right wing in our republic, promoting the idea of Eurasia. Ivan Serov, a former member of the Communist Party, having now turned to his own ideology of Urdu socialism. And then lastly there is Sergei Taburitsky, wanting to return to the supposed righteous path of Tsarist Russia. Still, this conflict is only in the shadows. To the outside world, the right coalition is more united than ever and ready to go to war. The conflict over West Russia has already started with the Vyatka Perm War. So the government decided to begin as well. Sending the whole army to our weakest neighbor, the Order of St. George. A few days before the operation was launched, the West Russian Revolutionary Front had declared war on them, but they had failed to gain any ground. So we began marching east into the territory with no resistance at all and managed to capture their capital. But with our help in a battle, the Revolutionary Front cut us off from the rest of the Order and could continue without us, securing the whole nation for themselves. We must get our revenge but they are stronger than us. We need someone's help and luckily there is a warlord in the west of us that can help us. Volgoda shares a similar ideology as our country and the government sent a proposal of reunification to them. In the meantime the divided coalition found unity around the economy to prepare for the new resources we will gain once we invade people. And the military was also prepared by learning from the mistakes of the White Army, mainly that of too little supply. A few days after the Revolutionary Front had sent an ultimatum to us, Volgoda arrived with the response. Announcing total unification between our two states and militaries. We are now about as strong as the Revolutionary Front and more than ready to destroy them. And as I said that, they declared war. Probably not expecting our annexation of Volgoda, they had no divisions in the area and we could start to march north towards Archangels, their capital. One single unit was seen fighting back, effectively pushing back our single tank division only to get encircled by neighboring forces. Continuing north, our divisions arrive to Archangels, sadly meeting resistance in the city. As of now, the war has gone brilliantly, but we need to hurry. Rumors of an attack is spreading. So we quickly continued by encircling Archangels, but failed several times to enter it. And then it happened. Vyatka declared war on us, forcing us to deploy seven backup divisions. And back to the north, the situation was also deteriorating with the revolutionary counterattack. But our brilliant generals outmaneuvered their forces that to encircle two of ours had left Archangels completely open. We managed to capture the city and destroy the garrison in Severodvinsk to bring the revolutionary close to capitulation. But before that happened our military had to launch an offensive into Ukta, capturing their new provisional capital. The West Revolutionary Front did now surrender and we can turn our whole army to Vyatka. But as our external policy 
politics are looking brighter than ever, the conflict inside the coalition is growing. As all other political threats have been eliminated, there is no unifying factor anymore. And the worrying reality is that the winner of all this is the madman Sergei Taboritsky, not only a monarchist but a lunatic. He believes Alexei wasn't murdered by the communists and that he needs to be found to return Russia to its true greatness. This is complete madness, how can anyone believe him? Taboritsky will pave the way for Alexei to return by returning Russia to the righteous path and his power in the government is already growing. He has managed to appoint his friend and leader of his paramilitary group, Viktor Larinov, as a new defense minister. The first thing he passed was to legalize child labor with the goal of turning them into a hardened force of cold-blooded men. But his influence is even greater than this. Taboritsky has tied orthodoxy back to our state to prepare us for a monarchy. He also got the support of the order of St. George after investing in rebuildment efforts of their monasteries. Taboritsky will continue to grow his power, but we are now ready to strike Vyatka, the monarchy with Vladimir III in place, a pretender. We began by taking back the provinces we had captured, outnumbering them in the specific area since we had decided to leave our front open in other states. Once we liberated Slobodsky, we decided to continue over the river and into the state of Vyatka. We captured ust Shepsta, and one of our motorized divisions managed to divide their country in two. The defenders of Vyatka, their capital, tried to desperately defend, but our overwhelming numbers and firepower easily won. Still, we have taken far larger casualties than the Vyatkan army, so they didn't surrender, but this resistance is hopeless. As we divided the country, they had a massive gap in the eastern pocket and we could exploit this to march deep into their country, capturing cities such as Glazov, Igra and Izevsk. We also began an offensive from the north, where we successfully captured two cities, but they began counter-attacking and managed to capture one of them back. Still, with Yelabuga and several of their leaders and generals captured, they had no choice but to surrender. The only strong contender left is now Samar but before we invade them, Taboritsky and several others have decided to replace the old constitution of the Rotten Republic with a new monarchist constitution. This will prepare us for a holy Russia. The clock begins ticking. But Alexei will never return if we stay in Ustsyslolsk, our capital riddled with Bolshevik legacy. Instead, we will change it to Vyatka, a perfect city where the pretender Vladimir III just resigned in and no Bolshevik legacy is to be found. And Taboritsky will of course be the Grand Duke of the city. We are now more than ready to destroy Samara and unify Western Russia. They are defeated, Western Russia is ours, but before we can proclaim our new state, one last convention has to be taken place to decide the ultimate leader of our state. The destiny of Russia has to be decided, and the answer is clear, Taboritsky has triumphed. Long live the new Tsar, he will pave the way for Alexei to return. The imperial regency of Western Russia has been established. Yet there remains so much to do. The unholy degeneracy of our state has to be cleansed for a pure Russia to rise out of its ashes and for Alexei to finally arrive. With the help of the Burgundian system, 
system, an ingenious creation of God. We will cleanse Russia of impure races and secure it for the true master race. But the forces of evil are striking back. The clock has already struck the first hour. Midnight must never be allowed to come. So we must deal with them. The Ukraina will rise from the dead and the region's visions will guide them to the evil. Eyes in every house, our knowledge of the devil's acts will grow. And with this knowledge we will be able to stop it. The lands of Russia will move towards absolute purity. The gulags will be repurposed, now camps for Bolsheviks, not their enemies. But the regent can't fix this alone, we will set bounties on the parasites to mobilize the ordinary people. But we must remember why we are doing this. We must place our trust in Sergei Taboritsky so he can restore the rightful throne of Alexei. When our immortal sovereign is found, he will reign Russia for all time. And naturally, every Tsar needs a trustworthy court, but right now it is not so. Piotr Shabelsky Bork, an old friend of Taboritsky, has started speaking with the forked tongue of Satan, who will immediately be replaced. We have now accomplished so much here in the West, yet there remains so much to do. The false claimants to the rulership of Russia across the Ural Mountain dismiss our claims to divine sponsorship. We must cast them to hell so that Alexei can finally return. But they are strong, we must quickly prepare our economy and military. The clock has already struck the third hour. And while we prepare, we can strike down the two states in the Urals before the West Siberian People's Republic has the chance to act. But first, to the economy. The wealth of Russia will be utilized to its fullest potential. The imperial treasury will be filled through our confiscation economy. The failures of Bolshevism will also be torn down and our imperial corporations will replace them. Now to the Urals, our army has plowed through Orenburg in a few weeks and could then turn to the Ural League. While their troops were elite, they were far too few to withstand us. Back to our industry, since the populace has no need for mass-produced capitalist crap, we can use all the riches of the earth to create grand industrial projects, cathedrals of industry. Our focus can now turn to the army and then we can strike east at Khrushchev. Our conscription will be enlarged with loyalty in mind, strength in body and purity in soul. And they must remember there is no international law. The chemical weapons of Syktavar are God's gift. They must be used and expanded. As the clock struck the twelfth hour and our region had succeeded in absolute purity of Western Russia, we started prepare for the Ural War, developing supply chains, raising reserves and infiltrating their intelligent services. Our half a million army was soon ready to strike. Our regent commanded the army to begin and the invasion started. We effectively slain the Bolshevik troops. While we had problems in the Urals, we easily broke through from Magnitogorsk without meeting much resistance. Shelitabinsk was captured and our motorized divisions continued towards their capital. With surprisingly no divisions defending it, we could enter it and destroy all Soviet degeneracy, capturing and destroying Lenin's body. We could now turn back towards Sverdlovsk while one division marched towards Omsk. The resistance around Sverdlovsk was tough, but since we advanced from the west, east and the south, they had to spread out their troops thinly, allowing us to gain ground and soon capture the city. While they didn't surrender immediately, Khrushchev had already fled the country and the small resistance that was left fled into the countryside. No longer are we the imperial regency of Western Russia. We are the Holy Russian Empire. Our mandate from heaven has been expanded, but this new land is full of impurity. A second cleansing will have to take place. But we have faced another problem as well. As the clock continues moving forward, people are beginning to doubt us, mainly the church. They will have to be dealt with too, but first, Western Siberia. The Caucasian method will begin to be used. The impurities will be forced to bolster the outputs of our farms, factories and mines. But this won't fix everything. Chemical terror bombing could, and the fires of redemption surely will. We can now 
now turn to the war within, the false shepherds, those who promise their loyalty to us but still are corrupted by Satan must be cleansed, and the lying parts of our own security forces whose goal is to purify Russia will also have to be purged. A new purity order will be formed to inspect all parts of our state and the church, those corrupted by evil will be destroyed. Holy Russia is now the true kingdom of God on earth. All we have to do now is to unify the rest of it and then Alexei can return. We started developing even more weapons of mass destruction, starting our nuclear program and further developing our chemical weapons. But despite the knowledge of God helping us, our scientists weren't at all ready with our nukes as Taboritsky announced further expansions. The clock has already struck the 16th hour, Alexei will be found. Beginning with the invasion of Kazakhstan, if they won a single baton is questionable, those who stood their ground and fought back were immediately destroyed in the name of God. We even tried out some of our new weapons and as we arrived close to their capital they surrendered not daring to face our wrath. About a year after the invasion we had finished preparations for the last battle. The Siberian Federation will be destroyed and Russia will be unified. Then Alexei can return. 